Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Educators Town Hall. Um, tonight, we are talking to a group of educators, and we're so happy that you guys could all join us tonight. Um, we just want to recognize your hard work. Everyone at the ADA is so very proud of everything you've been doing with your boots on the ground, helping us get the newest generation of dental assistants out there. Um, we know that it's been very difficult with the pandemic that's going on, and we're hoping that this town hall tonight, we can get some good discussion going on maybe how to make your life a little bit easier. Uh, so tonight, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about data gathered from our educator survey that was sent out a few weeks ago. Um, Natalie Kavetsky will talk about the drop in class sizes. We'll talk about the lack of hands-on experience due to online learning, and Lisa Childers will be doing that. And then I will be speaking on infection control and student and staff safety. And finally, President Robin Rixey will be speaking on finding clinical sites in the pandemic world. So before we get started, let's just go through and um, we're going to have the panelists introduce themselves. My name is Sarah Stream. I am the ADAA 8th District Trustee and I live just outside of Omaha, Nebraska right now. Um, President Robin, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Robin Rixey. I'm the ADAA president. I've been in dentistry for 30, uh, it'll be 31 years on September the 9th. Um, I am currently a practice manager for a private practice dental office and um, love everything to do with ADAA and just really uh, glad that you guys were willing to have us all on here today. So. We look forward to answering your questions, and if there's something we can't answer tonight, uh, we will do our best to get that answer for you and get it out to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Robin. Natalie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Natalie Kabetsky. I'm a licensed dental assistant uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am also a former educator and program director of a COTA accredited program. Uh, and I still keep busy uh, dealing with students uh, rotating through our clinic, uh, not only dental assisting, but hygiene and dental therapy also. Uh, busy in dentistry, been a dental assistant for 28 years now and love every aspect of it. Thanks so much, Natalie. Lisa, are you still with us? Would you like I'm to introduce here. yourself? Awesome. I'm still here. I'm Lisa Childers. I am the ninth district trustee for ADIA. I am a dental educator in a CODA program, and this is my 14th year of teaching, and I have been in dental assisting for 31 years. Thank you, Lisa. And for those of you out there, you'll notice uh, you can't see Lisa's smiling face tonight. She is in an area with some bad storms tonight, so we're trying to save some, some bandwidth, and hopefully um, she won't lose internet completely. Before we get started with our topics, I just want to remind everybody of some house rules. Um, we are happy to answer any questions that you might have during this presentation. So on your end, you should be, see a question box. If you want to type your questions into the question box, we'll be watching that question box throughout the presentation and we'll try to get everybody's questions answered for them. Um, if we don't get to your question, there will be a slide at the end with some contact information. And if you have more questions, you're more than, we're more than happy to answer them if you wanna email us your questions. We are also recording tonight's town hall. So we will have it posted on YouTube, um, hopefully within the next few days for anybody that might've missed it. So if you know an educator that wasn't able to make the call, have them hop over to our YouTube channel and find this webinar and get all this great information. All right, let's get started here. So we're gonna start talking about the survey results. Um, I created a survey on Google Docs. Of, it's been about a month now, and uh, we blasted it out on Facebook and um, to our members through email. And this survey was geared towards educators to kind of gather information on what their year is going to look like. So we got information on the program location, the type of program, and some of the different issues that are being faced with educators right now in the world of the pandemic that we're living in. 
um, we were very happy to get 78 responses to the survey. So if you were one of those people that responded, thank you, we appreciate it. Um, it's always good to have some insight on what's going on across the country. So I just have some statistical graphs here from the survey. This is the, uh, the span of states that everybody was in. Um, if everyone can see here, California was our, our most loved state for this survey. Um, we had 14 participants from California, so thank you. But it looks like we had participants from you know, almost every other state as well. Out of those 78 responses, about two thirds of you guys are CODA approved programs. So we have some educators that are not in CODA approved programs right now, which is absolutely okay. Um, we just kind of wanted to get a feel for who all was dealing with CODA issues as well. Um, this was how your program has decided they will return in the fall. And the majority of everybody looks like they will be going back in a hybrid style. So that's a combination of face-to-face -face classes and online learning. Um, I'm guessing that most of that face-to-face -face will be for hands-on clinicals and labs. Um, are your anticipated enrollment rates affected? So over half of you determined that your enrollment rates for this year have been affected by the pandemic. And I'm sure that um, that is very widespread throughout the country right now with everything going on and the fear of being able to go back to school. Um, and then graduation rates. Um, almost half of you guys said that uh, your graduation rates would be affected by the pandemic. So we got some really good results from this survey. And um, if you guys have anything to add to these results, you wanna let us know specifically about your program or you have questions about these results, please let us know. And we'll get some contact information out at the end. Um, next, I'm going to hand things over to Miss Natalie. All right, we are going to talk about changes in class size. And not everyone had a change or a drop in their class size. Some people actually have a wait list, uh, which is great to hear. Uh, we are going to do a quick poll on program demographics right now. And uh, the first question is, are you affili affiliated with the CODA Dental Assisting Program? And is your program over 750 hours or under 750 hours if you're a CODA program? And then if you're not affiliated with a CODA dental assisting program, is your program 750 hours or more or under? I believe we have a poll on a slide. I put the poll out there. All right. So those of you that are affiliated with the CODA program, uh, if you could check the appropriate uh, box, whether your program is over the 750 hours or under. And for those of you that are not with the CODA program, uh, we'll have another slide uh, almost identical that you can answer on. We'll give it a few more seconds. All right, so those of you that are affiliated with the CODA Dental Assisting Program, 84% uh, of you have your program um, being comprised of 750 or more hours and 16% of you under 750 hours. Uh, interesting information for us. All right, the next question, Sid. All right, this is for those of you that are not affiliated with the CODA Dental Assisting Program. Same question, 
Is your program over 750 hours or is it under 750 hours? We'll give it a couple seconds for everyone to respond. All right, let's flip to the results, please. All right, so 66% have their program consisted of 750 or more hours and 34% under 750 hours. Thank you everyone for participating in that. Next slide, please. Not sure who has the controls. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I do. All That's right. Cool. It's kind of like me fighting with the dentist in the operatory over the rheostat who gets to uh, push down on the rheostat. <laughs> It does look like in the audience questions, there was the question, how many people are in the webinar? And currently it looks like we have 87 participants. Pretty good number, thank you. All right, next polling question. For those of you affiliated with a CODA dental assisting program, what is typically your normal class size uh, prior to the pandemic? 10 to 15 students, 16 to 20, or over 21 students. There'll also be a polling question for those of you um, not affiliated with a Dakota accredited program. We'll take just a second. All right, so 29% have typically 10 to 15 students in their classes, 31% 16 to 20, and 40% have a normal class size of over 21 students. Wow. Next polling question, and these are for those that are not with a CODA accredited program. Again, asking about your normal class size. Your class size 10 to 15, 16 to 20, or over 21 students. And you had mentioned this was prior to the pandemic, Natalie? Prior, yep, prior to the pandemic. Because we're going to open up discussion a little bit to talk about what your current class size is. All right, just a few seconds and we'll see the results. All right, 55% typically will have 10 to 15 students, 31% 16 to 20, and only 14 have class sizes over 21 students. Very interesting, thank you. I think so too. Uh, next slide, please. I can share with you uh, the first time I ever taught a um, brand new educator, and I taught ShareSide 1, uh, both lecture and lab or actually clinic, 
And I had 60 students in my lecture class, which wow. was amazing uh, to have at that time. Uh, this was back in 2006. So, uh, those were some long days for me. <laughs> You should see the next slide. I don't see it yet. Oh. Well. So Natalie, with a classroom that size, where did you hold your lectures? Uh, we had a lecture hall that could accommodate uh, comfortably about 75. OK. Uh, and so dental assisting was taught during the daytime hours and hygiene was taught in the evening and on weekends and we tended to share that lecture room. Still waiting on the slide. Okay, hold on just a second. <laughs> Gotta love technology. Do you see it? Nope. There we go. All right. So we're going to talk about um, modifying the routines that we normally would have uh, in education, uh, starting with discussion on de decreased class sizes, which I'm assuming is what most of you are facing. Uh, just with social distancing, fears, and perhaps um, just not maybe not having enough applicants. Uh, also going to just briefly discuss impacted funding and supplies. As all of us know, even those working in private or corporate practices, we're having a hard time getting certain supplies, especially PPE. Uh, and disinfecting and sterilization supplies. And then also, um, especially for those of you with CODA programs, your faculty numbers could be impacted, especially if enrollment goes down. Uh, or on the reverse side, if your enrollment goes up. And then impacted uh, cohorts starting. I know some programs will start multiple times throughout the year. And perhaps during this pandemic time, uh, you may see a change where you may only hold one start uh, to a class. So at this time, I would like to open up the discussion. Um, if anyone would like to talk about how their programs were affected um, by decreased class sizes. Sarah, are you keeping an eye on the comment box? or I am keeping an eye on the question box. I haven't seen anything come in yet. All right. We'll give you guys a couple. I know during one of our discussions, someone had mentioned that they actually had increased class sizes. Um, I believe that was Lisa. Uh, and that is actually the next slide. It's similar to this one, but just talking about uh, the increase in class sizes. Lisa, would you like to share about the fact that you have a wait list for your program? We did have a wait list this year, which is the first time in about five years. I live in a relatively, relatively rural area, and we're just struggling to get 14 to 16 students every year. And this year, we, um, we, we're starting with 14, even though we do have a wait list, because of the size of the classroom and labs. Uh, for those of you who may not know Lisa, she is from Arkansas, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Getting ready to see the bands of Hurricane Laura. Yeah. Lisa, any feedback or input as to why so many? We have had a lot of dental assistants in this area that are not going back into the office, and the demand has been pretty high for dental assistants, um, but they're really wanting the assistants to be trained now more than just um, infection control is a real big thing for the offices and I've been approached to come in and review offices on their infection control procedures and give them pointers or corrections that they need and so they're, the dentists are recommending applicants go through the dental assisting program also. Wonderful. 
Uh, Daniel Clover had his hand up and his microphone is uh, open now. Go ahead, Daniel. Yes, uh, so I'm in the RDA EF2 program at Loma Linda and uh, our class didn't start virtual until the uh, 20, uh, the 20th of uh, this month. We had been in school since July 7th, and it oh, was wow. it was online. So the and the EF2 is is uh, you know 410 hours. So. What we're trying to do is make sure that we don't miss any lab because from now on, starting the 30th, we're going to have lab for eight hours, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's a uh, uh, lecture for for four hours. So uh, what I've noticed is, you know, they're they're taking their precautions. We have face masks. They take our temperature. They ask, do the questionnaire, and we also have. Uh, 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 cover for our glasses, even if you wear glasses. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of extensive, but you got to take uh, in consideration that uh, with uh, 20 students, you know, it's, it's like really dangerous in one respect, but, you know, there's not a lot you can do about it unless you take the precautions. Right. Have you noticed a decrease in numbers that you would normally have for your uh, class enrollment? Not necessarily. As a result of the pandemic? No. No? Okay. Good. That's great. Um, I do know that uh, there is an extreme shortage of dental assistants, um, not only throughout the United States, but it is a worldwide problem of having competent dental assistants. So it's not only those of us here in North America, meaning Canada and the US, um, but they are experiencing the same thing in other countries. And you know, as we know here in the US, you go to the ne state next door and you might not be able to do whatever duties you can do in your own state, um, similar to what other countries are like too. So we all practice the same, however, we're not allowed to do everything, so. Well, thank you for sharing that, David. Yeah. Sarah, anybody else? Or Should, Daniel, Judy, sorry. <laughs> Judy Shannon, her microphone is now open. Go um, ahead, I, Judy. Hi, thank you for having this because it's very interesting. I um, I have half a cl class size starting in a month. My applicants are down 40%. And uh, I just find that there are, I get a call every day for an assistant. I just don't have enough people to fill the position. I am able to get my supplies, so to speak, but um, it's very difficult. And we're going back hybrid so that we can get our labs in because we are accredited and it's important. I'm going to run as many labs ahead of schedule than I that I can before we possibly get shut off again but in Massachusetts they're being very strict and uh, we're ahead of the curve as far as that's concerned. I was just, just going to ask where are you from I can hear the east coast accent. <laughs> yeah I'm sorry it's the end of the day my accent is awful. <laughs> no. I'm tired. <laughs> that's all. Well thank but you for I, sharing I, that. <laughs> I don't see anything else in the chat box. All right, we'll go on to the next slide then, uh, which is uh, just whether or not there were increases in class size, uh, which Lisa shared you know, about the wait list. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. All right, something to think about what this pandemic can have on not only what our current status is within educating uh, dental assistants, but also the future. You know, how could it affect or impact dental assisting education? Not only the CODA accredited programs, but not CODA accredited programs. Uh, also the future of dental assisting profession. You know, we're already in a huge worldwide shortage. Uh, I'm from Minnesota and we've had an extreme shortage it's got to be close to a decade now uh, where I went from a 
50 an hour a week management position to being clinical 40 plus hours a week. So uh, tough on the body, but I love it. So what is the solution? Has anyone really thought about the future? Would love to hear any ideas anybody is willing to share about the future of dental assisting education. Natalie, I'd like to ask a question of, of all of our, our participants right now. Um, Lisa, and I think you touched on this just a little bit. Are you seeing um, dentists and dental offices reaching out to you as uh, instructors asking for more educated dental assistants than what you've seen in the past? I believe what we've seen a lot of, you know, in the past is, uh, oh, we can bring them into our office and we can train them. But Lisa mentioned that they are looking for more qualified, competent dental assistants. Are other um, instructors on the call finding the same situation? Melody Randolph. Melody Randolph, her microphone is Hi. unmuted. Hello. Hey, Melody. Um, hi. hi, I was going to answer before um, that I'm from Sacramento City College and we um, are not uh, Sacramento, California, and we are not actually being able to um, take a new cohort this year at all because of COVID. So there we have no class for this next year. Um, and on top of that, our students um, from last year were not able to come back and finish. So they're still in limbo until sometime next year. Oh so God. that's, yeah, that's where we are. Um, sorry, where's my brain? Um, what was the last question? Oh, the shortage. Um, our shortage is in California is tremendous. And I think what's mm -hmm. happening in Northern California is that um, we're actually seeing the opposite is that we're going to um, less education and more on the job training because of the shortage um, wow. and more and more certification programs opening up um, that are not necessarily even with a, a school. So there's a lot more training going on that's not official education um, because of the shortage. Thank wow. you. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? The next one who I've. Okay. Priscilla Dinarski, she needs to unmute herself. No, she's unmuted. Okay. Priscilla Dinarski? Yeah, can you guys hear me? You can. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I am in New Jersey. Uh, my program is not accredited. Uh, it's not CODA. It's accredited, but not a not CODA accredited. Mm -hmm. um, and I have actually have more students coming in now than ever, like ever since wow. I started teaching. It's the biggest amount. My All my classes are full until my next class that I have availability. We, we have a new class, like because it's continuous cycle. So we mm -hmm. have a new class every seven weeks. So. All of my classes are filled until December now for the day class. For the night wow. class, it's only twice a year, so it's still filling up. Uh, more and more people coming to the to the school to try to get in. Um, more than ever, I've never seen this. It's it's never been so high. And then I uh, extremely high demand. And then now we're seeing a lot of uh, the dentists offering more money, which I believe is what's going to be ended up happening with the profession. The part of like having to have education, I. I see that the hands-on part of that um, makes sense, but I feel like because of the shortage, they're going to have to end up upping up the pay. And then because of that, they're going to start requiring a little bit more education or at least like formal training. So I think the, the students that are going to school right now or have finished school not too long ago are going to have an advantage as far as that. A lot of assistants quit in New Jersey. There's a, like We're getting like calls for you know, 20, 30 different offices like every week asking for people and we don't have enough to send. Wow. That's actually great. <laughs> Yeah, we're seeing the same thing in Pennsylvania. Um, I do the hiring for my office, and right now there are 42 jobs on Indeed um, looking for dental assistants. And so as an office, trying to compete with that is, is just about impossible. But no, I, I agree with you that there's definitely a, 
a need out there. Lindsay Wisnerski? Yes. Close enough. Lindsay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am with National Dental Academy of Wisconsin, um, and here in Wisconsin, we um, I'm getting three, four, or five calls a day wanting dental assistance, but then our practices that host our clinicals are hesitant to have extra students in their offices. So that's kind of one of the issues that we're running into. Um, one of our biggest locations, the doctors basically told us, ah, I just, I just don't think we should have any extra bodies in the office right now. So one of the things we're working through as educators is just trying to find other places that will welcome our students because there are definitely many, many places that are in need of good educated dental assistance. So um, just kind of wanted to share what we're going through in our state. Wonderful. And I think uh, we will be discussing that uh, during Robin's uh, presentation portion. So that'll be exciting to hear what other people have to share on that. Thank you. We will, and just in the interest of time, it's already at 7.30, so I think we're going to move on. And I apologize to anybody that had their hand raised and we didn't get to them, but if you would like to discuss this more with us, um, like I said earlier, there will be some contact information at the end of this presentation. So send us all your emails, we wanna hear it all. <laughs> Um, if we get enough interest, Sarah, we can always do this again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, we're very glad to have everybody on and um, having this discussion because it's an important one to have. Yeah. It's our future. Right. It is our future, and we appreciate all the hard work that everyone's doing. All right. Um, next, we'll be speaking on hands-on experience during the remote learning that everyone is dealing with, and that will be Ms. Lisa Childers. Lisa, are you still on with us? I'm still on. Okay. Hi, everyone. I, as a CODA program director, hands-on experience is very important for our CODA accreditation, but not only is it important for that, it's important for these dentists. And with us, we are we're not remote learning yet we are face-to-face -face programs still but we are having to develop plans to go remote and um our plans you know we have to look at how do we provide this hands-on experience during remote learning our plan is is to bring the students in much like a lot of you that participated in the survey that um sarah shared the results with us are doing a hybrid program, you know, bringing in small groups for the labs. And that's what we're, we've reduced our lab size and we do um, two groups in labs. So it's doubled our lab time as instructors, but it's been really nice working with the much smaller groups. Um, during a complete remote, I developed a plan so that my students, could, I got permission so that my students could still come in we're going to be wearing our personal protection equipment, which will include our disposable gowns, our masks, our safety glasses. Even if we wear glasses, we have safety glasses, Googles that we use. And my, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going through my list. Face shield. We'll have our face shield, our mask, our Googles. And we do have disposable gowns that my students will be wearing this semester, particularly. Um, <clears throat> like I said, we are doing small groups. And then if we go completely remote, we're looking at developing a toolkit. Um, I got these ideas from other program directors that are remote right now, but they have developed toolkits. They are videoing the demonstration and then the students will check out a toolkit um, not every competency can be done that way but the basics can such as how to put on the PPE the proper way what is proper um, film placement in x-rays with the dentitis forms transferring instruments um, I checked into Walmart and you can get a mouth mirror and explorer at Walmart for $3.99 much cheaper than I could order them from a supplier for my class so um, 
we're having them video themselves. Our plan is, is to have them video themselves for the checkoffs. We are um, use we we continue to use Evolve website for instrument identification. Um, I'm, you know, I'm kind of like the rest of the educators. This is new territory, so we're just we brainstorm and we're trying and I'm trying to open this up for ideas for us to share because I used some ideas from the last town hall and I'm hoping this time to learn new ideas. Lisa, check out the dollar store. We just found mouth mirror, explorer, a tongue scraper, um, a whole kit for, uh, it had five different instruments in it for a dollar at the dollar store. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> I will because I, you know, I'm looking at developing kits because there's just some things I'm not going to be able to send out, you know, impressions are going to have to be done in person, that kind of stuff, you know, taking x-rays, that's mandatory, you know, I'm, they're going to have to take x-rays before they're allowed to take them on a live patient. Any questions or ideas? Barbara Bonner. Um, we are currently right now just at a um, completely online situation. We do um, YouTube videos and lectures, PowerPoints, but as far as hands-on, we haven't been allowed to have any students in doing any hands-on. Is your school completely closed for anybody on the campus? Yes. Um, the only ones that are allowed on campus are the teachers. And um, we do have smart boards, which we're able to teach things like charting and things on, on our smart boards that the students can learn with that. Um, but it's still, there's no, there's no exchange for, for not seeing face-to-face -face students. You have to, you have to teach what face-to-face. -face. Yes. For most of the information. Any feedback on when you might be able to go to face-to-face? -to -face? Um, we're hoping right now January, but it's up in the air. We're kind of like Sacramento where everything is closed up and nobody is saying anything about letting us open so don't know um i've this is my 29th year teaching my 45th year in the field and i've never seen anything like it <laughs> that is true thank you Anyone else did? I'm looking. Judy Shannon. <laughs> Judy Shannon. Hi, um, Judy. I like the idea about a toolkit um, because I was thinking if I have such a small amount of students, then I could, um, I have enough typodont so I could send them home with a typodont and they could make up their own videos with everything like that as far as uh, transferring of instruments even with someone else in the household. I find that the students are very inventive when you ask them to do something and actually uh, I, act, I learn quite a bit from it and enjoy it when they get to show everything. Um, so I just wanted to put in my two cents. <laughs> That's all. I think that toolkit is an uh, awesome idea. And uh, I'm definitely going to the dollar store tomorrow. I have three within a 10-mile radius, and I'm going to hit them big. I'm going to hit some, too. And if I can get some extras, uh, if you want to uh, send me an email at r r i x s e at adaausa.org, I will um, start collecting them and send them out as I'm able. Can you uh, give me your email again? It's R R R I X S E at A D A A U S A dot O R G. And Sid, Thank if you. you're able to type, uh, if you're able to type that into the answer box, that would be great, Sid or Sarah. Okay. 
Um, I was able to get a, a thermometer temperature check, you know, the ultraviolet one, at the dollar store. Uh, you have to ask for it. They actually had them. And um, I found that Ocean State, for those in the Northeast area, also has them, but you had to ask. So that was good. I think it's a great idea that you're getting your students involved in asking for their input because they're really a big stakeholder in all of this right now. And so, you know, um, looking to them for, for possible solutions is a great idea. Yeah, they've been pretty good about it. But I graduated all my students, they're all working, so I'm working on next year's class. I'm hoping they're as enthusiastic as last year's. So we'll see. That's great. Awesome. Thank you so much for all of the input, you guys. Um, we are going to move on to the next topic just so we don't run out of time. I'm afraid with so much discussion that we might. Um, but, you know, I'm willing to stay later if anyone else is. I'll keep talking. You know me, I always like to talk, so that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our next topic is um, infection control and then student staff safety with the pandemic going on. And I didn't change the, the name on this slide. <laughs> it's supposed to be me. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, That was my typo. Uh, so... I just wanted to share with everybody, there is some new guidance from CDC on how to deal with things during COVID-19. Um, if you go to this uh, link, which I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with, it is the most up-to-date COVID guidance for dental settings. And there are some big changes in what we've been doing uh, for years and years and years. Um, the first big change is that they're recommending respirators and face shields be used for any aerosol generating procedures. Okay, before COVID, respirators were not really a thing in dentistry. We wore surgical masks, we wore our goggles, and you know maybe a face shield if it was a really big surgery and kind of getting messy. But respirators were not uh, very commonly used in dentistry, especially in private practice. Um, the next one is uh, making sure all of your employees at all times have some sort of face covering. So even front desk wearing their cloth face mask just to help protect everybody in the office. Um, even your assistants and clinical staff when they're not in the operatory and just you know cleaning or sterilizing or whatever should be wearing those face coverings as well. And then adding or upgrading your ventilation systems to help filter out air and maintain that COVID free workplace. Um, you know, there are a lot of different recommendations on that and how to make it work. Um, and then a big one that CDC put out was um, a cleaning calculator. And they did put out a recommendation to just let a room sit for 15 minutes after a procedure before cleaning. Um, that was a hard and fast 15 minutes, just let it sit. Uh, since then, that has been redacted, and they've put out this cleaning calculator to determine that wait time. So it depends on the size of your operatory and your airflow systems and everything else you have going on, how long you should be waiting. Now, those are just general guidelines for dentistry um, when you're working in private practice. Let's see if this will go forward. There we go. With, um, with OSHA guidance, um, OSHA requires anytime anybody is using a respirator, they have to have a written respiratory protection plan in place and providers have to have a medical questionnaire filled out and reviewed by a medical doctor and you need to have initial fit testing done. Um, this written plan should be kept with the rest of your OSHA binder. And I'm not sure how this will play out as a part of an educational facility and what requirements CODA is going to put into play with this. But it is a good thing to keep in mind that you may have to put something like this together for you and your students and your program. Um, and I do have a poll question for you guys. Um, have you considered adding fit testing and the respiratory protection plan into your curriculum? So just take a few seconds and answer this question for me, if you would, please. Thank you. 
Give it just about five more seconds and then we'll close out the poll. Awesome, so it looks like about half of you have already considered adding that fit, fit testing into your curriculum, which is great. Um, if you haven't considered it yet and you need some guidance, there is a lot of guidance on the OSHA website about how to implement that written respiratory protection plan. Um, and if you need additional guidance, uh, you guys can feel free to reach out to me. I have a template that is more geared towards dentistry instead of hospital-based. Um, and I don't know, Sid, you can feel free to put my email into the chat as well. For some reason, my chat feature isn't working well. Um, and if anybody wants that template, I will be more than happy to send it out. I know I've shared it with Robin and Natalie and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people. Um, and could we possibly go back to the slides as well, Sid? I will let you know it's a really awesome template. So if you're looking for something like that for a respiratory pr uh, program, please reach out to Sarah. It is well, well written, well thought out, lots of great information. Yeah, and that template is actually, it is made to be a fillable template. So you could potentially just input your office or school name and you know fill in some stuff and it is a standalone plan itself. So hopefully that will help some people out. Um, let's see, my slide isn't going for it. There we go. Oh. Okay, so I want to open it up a little bit to some discussion here um, for maybe a minute. We can maybe take a couple of people. Um, what do you think would be some of your barriers for fit testing, having that in your curriculum? Do we have anybody, Sid? Not yet. I don't see anyone. I know one barrier I've heard of quite a bit is just the availability of someone to come in and do fit testing. Mm -hmm. People are having a hard time finding that. And I know everybody has been really crazy with COVID going on, but usually your local public health department can point you in the right direction, whether it's a local hospital, um, sometimes uh, sales reps are trained to do that. So, you know, if you have that barrier, reach out to public health. That's their job to help. Uh, I do have some people who've raised their hands. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Trying to get the mic unmuted here. Okay, let's try right here. Can't get the mic unmuted. Um, okay. Eric, is it cannot take control attendees? Okay, Erica Kuvas. Hi. Hi, uh, Erica. This is my first time joining, um, and uh, all the this whole presentation has been very helpful. And uh, I I just had a question as to uh, I know Sarah mentioned that she had a more or less of a template that that she could send out. Um, yeah. Did she? Do, do you have like an email address where we can send you an email, or how do we contact you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Sid. No, it looks like Natalie put my email in the chat, but maybe it just went to organizers. It did. Um, <laughs> Sid, can you add it in so everybody can see it? Okay. We're we're really needy right now, Sid. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not not a problem. This is the one you want, then, Sarah. S stream. S stream at adaausa.org. Yeah, so Erica, feel free to send me an email if you want that template. I'd be more than happy to share it um, with anybody that wants it. Thank, let me know. thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. 
Did we have anyone else with questions? Tina Sprague. Yes, um, I. the barrier that we have is getting the fit tests and mm -hmm. then getting enough masks of varying sizes. Yeah, that is going to continue to be a barrier, unfortunately, um, with our PPE shortages. Just getting the supplies is going to be difficult. Um, and I think that actually leads into some of my next slides here. But, um, you know, with, can I click through to the next slide? Oh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, so um, prices are rising because of the availability of the, the base products that they use to manufacture all of our PPE over in China. And so, you know, we've seen increases in masks, gloves, gowns, face shields of up to 600%, even more. Um, and people just aren't able to get those. But I still want to encourage everybody, even if you maybe can't get respirators, like you need to be able to supply your whole program for an extended period of time, to still have somebody come in and do fit testing, even if you can get a few masks. And then students have already been fit tested. They've already had that questionnaire done. And then when they're ready to go out into the workforce, they can say, yes, I've done this. We, you know, I, I have my initial fit testing done, um, even if you're not able to use respirators on campus all the time. I still think it would be a very big benefit. Um, another product availability issue that people are having are disinfectant wipes. The wipes themselves are made of um, the same stuff, that melt blown. So, you know, just manufacturing the wipes, the paper towel part of your wipes, is becoming an issue. So a lot of manufacturers are, are not able to get wipes out, but they can get, you know, the five gallon jugs of liquid. And we still want to be cognizant of not spraying, right, because the spray is bad. Um, but in dire times, you could potentially make your own wipes if you have to, you know, if you just can't get wipes anywhere else. Um, so, you know, there are I have a, I have a thing I'll post in the Facebook group. I may have posted it. Um, that was just kind of a conversion table of what, like, what a 32 ounce spray bottle of uh, liquid disinfectant translates over into so many wipes, and what a gallon translates into into wipes. So I'll try to find that and post it on the Facebook group again. Um, and then making sure we are talking about the extended use for PPE right now. Um, with such a shortage, we need to make sure that we are getting that out to the students, that they know it is okay right now, because we're in this pandemic situation, to do extended use of PPE, but we need to make sure that we're telling them the right way to do it. And, um, you know, the right, the right parts of PPE that you can use for extended use. Obviously, we don't want to extended use our gloves, because that's disgusting. But if you only have one respirator for the day, there is a proper way to wear it all day long. So, um, and I am going to actually, just really quickly, student and staff safety, make sure everyone's wearing your masks while you're in class, unless you are having some sort of lab where you're a patient, um, and then maintaining six feet distance whenever you can, practicing hand hygiene appropriately and often and then um, promoting safe practices um, anywhere you're at. So even in social gatherings, making sure your students are staying safe off of campus. Um, I'm gonna hand this over to Robin. We're running out of time quickly. I apologize, Robin, I talked too much. No, not at all. It's good information. Yeah, um, let's see. Oh, there we go, okay. So Robin, take it away. All right, so, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about finding clinical sites in a pandemic world. Um, and I decided that I was going to kind of come at this from the perspective of the dentist. So um, because I work closely with dentists in my area, I uh, reached out to find out what some of their uh, concerns were, which I believe you're going to find that that, you know, they coincide with the challenges that you're seeing. So the, uh, the poll question is, are you having issues finding clinical sites for your students to go to? Yes or no? Yes. 
And I will let you know that we had an extern uh, during the time when our office actually shut down for nine weeks um, to all but emergencies. And um, uh, so they unfortunately weren't able to be doing their externship with us during the time that we weren't there. So I understand the challenges that you're facing at your, uh, in your programs. Alrighty. So guys, you guys know my vision. Uh, can you read those numbers for me? <laughs> Sure, it is a uh, yes of 38% and no of 62%. Well, that's excellent. I'm glad to hear that. All right, if we can move on to the next slide. So the first thing we're going to talk about are the challenges, and I kind of broke them up, broke them up into uh, four different areas. Um, and I'll just keep talking because I can remember pretty, I believe I can remember it for the most part. And the first one that we run into is that um, some dentists have chosen to retire and not reopen their practices at all. So you're going to see a reduction in the number of offices that are even available. Um, and then many practices that are open, um, they're, they've done so in a limited capacity due to the changes in patient and team safety protocols. So there's concern over lack of infection um, control knowledge by your extern intern to understand the need for these changes and how to perform them. So that's a challenge that you're going to be facing. And then the third are practices are finding it difficult to staff their offices, you know, as team members decide not to return. And with much of the responsibility for training uh, your students falling on the team, um, the team member, offices are reluctant to offer themselves as clinical sites due to a lack of available staff. And then the fourth is with the scarcity of necessary PPE, some offices are concerned with utilizing those resources on a student that's coming in to do their, um, their clinical uh, in, your off, in the office. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I really would like to hear from you. Are any of these uh, appropriate for your program? Are they the ones you're running into? Are there others? Um, I'd like to hear your feedback. Sid, I'm going to actually have you flip back to that site um, now that we know we're in the discussion that uh, slide, um, just so people can see what the different um, challenges are and whether or not they have any additional ones. Anybody have anything mm -hmm. you'd like to include? Ed, Ed, Ed K. Sloan. Go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we're, I am a non-CODA uh, school, and we're seeing the same issues. I have about 15 students. I have many students who cannot go on externship because the offices are not willing to take them, and it sounds like the same reasons that you have listed here. Um, so it's been very challenging. We have a lot of students kind of in limbo because they're done with a classroom training. Um, but cannot move on. But then there's also offices who are begging for for assistance. So I'm like, I don't, I'm not sure where you know how to fix the problem. I guess. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Barbara Bonner. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, I can, but okay. Um, we haven't been able to put any students out at all since last March so we have we have students that are waiting to go out and the need to finish their clinical training but we um, I have offices that call us daily that call me daily and say when are you going to have students for us we need students so I don't think we're going to have a problem putting them in when we're allowed to when you're allowed to okay all right we're just not we can't do it now got it Okay. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Judy Shannon. Go ahead, Judy. I didn't realize I uh, had clipped my uh, thing. I I don't have a problem. A lot of my offices that uh, my students who needed extern, they use the students as a um, a period of time, and then they hired them afterwards. So. Yep. I was able to put my students in offices that uh, were w willing to do the externship and then hire them, and it was great. 
and I I get so many calls and I I wish I had the students for them but I don't so Thank I can you. have a problem we actually did the same thing in our office we ended up hiring our um, hiring our student oh. anyone else um, I do have some questions in the question box okay um, so this one says some of us attending teacher dental assisting in vocational high schools okay um, i'm not sure what's that a question yeah i don't know uh this okay. one says a coda program requires 900 instructional hours okay um but, <clears throat> they do for whoever posed that question, they do require a little over 900, but 300 of those hours, which would drop it down to 600 face-to-face -face hours. Okay, next question, is this for lab or lecture? Lecture size is 24 students, lab sizes are limited to 12. I think it'll depend on the space of your facility how many people you can you can have in a lecture or a lab and still be able to safely conduct the class. Okay. Um, a Priscilla Dinarski said, I actually filled all my future classes. Extremely high demand in New Jersey. Wonderful. Awesome. Um, this person has left, but she said, we have pushed our start date back by a month. And this person has also left, and she said we are not being allowed to enter a new cohort this year. Oh, that is okay. Um, and the person also who left, she she commented, I went from 20 to 6 as of now. Normally wow. except 12. For another person said normally except 12 students accepted 14 this year and have an alternate list. Great. Awesome. Sid, could you, um, if you uh, advance to the two slides, well, what I've done next is I've kind of taken um, each of those four challenges and uh, suggested some solutions. So in the one where uh, the offices have not decided to reopen because the uh, dentists have decided to retire, um, if offices have closed, the solution might be just to broaden your search for new offices. And I realize that's that's like a, a duh question, but um, but that is one one thing that we might have to start doing is expanding our search for offices, especially given the shortage, maybe using that as a way to reach out to offices. Um, the second one, uh, concerns over lack of knowledge and understanding of the changes in infection co control protocols can be addressed with a brief synopsis of the curriculum taught and the focus placed on emphasizing the importance of infection control and prevention education to your program and in your classroom. And Lisa, this one came to mind because I was thinking of our conversation the other night where you talked about how you really are focusing on infection control because it's so important right now. So if you focus on it and you emphasize it and you, you share that information with the offices that they're going into, I believe that may overcome that challenge a little bit about their concerns over infection control. And then um, number three, pointing out the preparedness of your students as interns or externs may be a way to alleviate the concerns over training um, and potentially a way to help the practice find a new team member. Uh, a number of you have mentioned that tonight, that that's been a way that, that you've been able to get your students into sites. And this one is a little more challenging, but in conversation with an educator, um, at, they shared the possibility of providing PPE for the intern and extern to, as they go into the sites. And that may be a way to uh, alleviate the concerns of the offices that don't have the resources to uh, extend out to a student. Um, and one thing I can let you know as, as the one that, um, that um, orders all of the supplies for my office. It used to be one or two phone calls and I've placed all my orders um, for, the, for the week or every two weeks, depending upon how I'm ordering. Now it can be 10 to 12 
phone calls that I'm making, um, looking for different supply companies, um, you know, uh, asking questions of different people that um, Sarah is someone that put me in contact with a individual that was able to help provide KN95 masks for our office. Um, so it's just really a matter of you're going to have to broaden your search um, for PPE, uh, but that may be a way if you can supply that for your students of getting into different offices who have concerns over their resources. So any other um, ideas or solutions from anyone? I think another barrier that some may be facing is that offices don't want to have any legal responsibility if anything would happen to a student while they're in their office. That's very true. Any, Sid, anyone hands up or questions being asked? Uh, mm -hmm. I know it's a little past our time. I appreciate you guys' patience and um, a lot of information here. Um, but we'd love to hear your feedback uh, later on. If you, Sarah and I both gave you our email addresses, we'd love to hear from you. John Brewster. Go ahead, John. Hi, I'm from Citrus College in Southern California. Um, I had my hand up earlier, but I don't know if my computer wasn't working or not. But um, okay. we, we just went back this week um, to hybrid, so we're back on ground for labs. But the intern sites, um, we had a lot that that were really wanting them but one of the challenges was on a few of the offices was physical space you know mm -hmm. if they have a smaller office and they're trying to physically stay you know apart as much as possible it was just just became too crowded so that was one of the reasons and i do have a handful of students that couldn't come back um or did not want to come back because of being scared and I have a handful of pregnant ones, so we know what they were doing all during this whole break, but they didn't want to come back because of the fear of being pregnant, so it did affect my enrollment. But anyway, back to um, clinical sites. We did we had um, only had a couple that didn't want the students back, but then to counteract that, we had a few that actually asked if they can have more than one. So oh, wow. that helped, and they're all out, and uh, this was their first week, and it's gone really well so far. So fingers crossed it keeps going. That's wonderful. If you think about it, it that is definitely a challenge because I know just for um, my staff in my office, trying to find places for everyone to have lunch um, because everybody, you know, all 10 to 12 of us can't join in the lunchroom anymore. Um, you know, it's limited to four, so adding on an a student that could that could definitely be a challenge thank you in the, in the questions is anyone having students sign a covid liability release hmm that's a really good question yeah i hadn't even thought about it is there anyone out there that's doing that uh, we are at my office with our externs as well as our patients. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're actually having your patient sign a liability form to come into the office. Right. Wow. How that about any one good way to mitigate that uh, liability? Yeah, I've not thought of that. Interesting. It's what you get when you work with a work for a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any feedback from anyone um, on the call? No? Um, this is Judy Shannon. I seem to be talking a lot tonight, but oh, that's okay. Uh, my college is um, asking them to review and sign a release, and it's in my handbook. So they are also signing in my handbook that they have read it and agree with it, along with all the other policies in the college. All right. Okay, I'm trying to unmute a person here, and I can't seem to do it. I self-muted here, and okay, let's see if I can. Okay, let's see if we could get this person. Is it me, Heather? <laughs> Heather, <Yes>. no. Heather. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah, I have a fun last name. Um, 
I'm in La Puente, California, and we're doing hybrid. Um, all of our students, including myself, we've all had a side of COVID waiver, um, actually two of them. When the students that were in our last cohort, when they went back to their externship offices in the summer, they all had to sign the COVID waiver as well. Um, all my students completed. They all have jobs. And I've had 10 offices call me this week looking for assistance, and I have nobody. Wow. Heather, I have a question for you. Would you be willing to share that waiver with me so I could take a look at it? It doesn't have to have any, you know, any name on it or anything. Would you be willing to send me a copy? I can. Um, it's a paper version and it's actually at my work and I won't be back there till Tuesday, but I can share it, yes. That would be great. Thank you so much. No problem. All right, anyone else? Men Manolita, oh, she's self-muted. Okay. If she can unmute herself. Okay, go ahead. Hi, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm also uh, in the program that it's not going to approve. Um, yeah, we're giving our students, um, it's like a liability kind of paper that we made that they need to sign before they can come into the clinic. Okay. So it's like a waiver that we're saying, and, and even for our students, patient, when they come, they have to sign some paper that we're saying, it's saying in the paper that, yeah, we need to do a six feet social distancing, but because in dentistry it's impossible to do it, because we need to look at their mouth, we need to work in their mouth, uh, we're just making sure that they understand that and they have to sign an initial that paper. Okay. I'm curious, for those of you who are having them sign waivers, your students sign waivers, have you had anyone refuse to sign the waiver and decide not to be a part of the program? No? No. No? Okay. All right. Interesting. All right. Well, it's uh, about 9, um, 9, 12 on the East Coast anyway. Uh, are there any uh, last minute questions anyone would like to ask? Sid, if you could uh, click forward to the next slide. My clicker is not working. Um, okay. Just so we have that contact information up. And then um, both mine and Robin's emails are also in the chat. So if anybody has questions for either of us, um, feel free to reach out. We would love to hear from you. I will get the respiratory protection plan templates out to anybody that wants them. Just um, give me some time here. I'll get them out, you know, soon. A <laughs> couple days. Um, I also unmuted Dawn Brewster. She has had her hand up for quite a while. Oh, sure. Dawn, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. I was just answering when you were asking um, who, who signed waivers. So we have one waiver that all the students signed to come onto the campus to do their preclinical. And then we have a different waiver that we had them sign um, for their clinical sites and clinical rotations. And Robin, if you'd like me to send you what we have, I'd be happy to do so. That'd be fabulous. I'd love to see it. Thank you so much. Sure. And we didn't have anybody refuse to sign it. But like I said earlier, we had a handful that were just overall not willing to get back into dentistry right now. So I don't know if it's directly related to that waiver or not, but um, yeah, we had a few not come back. Okay. Um, let us know too, if you wouldn't be willing, uh, I mean, if you would be willing to send us out emails, would you like to do this again <laughs> next month? Um, and there's a lot of good information. Things are gonna continue to change. Um, so if you'd like to, us to do this again, please, um, feel free to share that information with us. And if you have other questions, maybe um, other areas that you'd like to discuss, you know, um, you will find that Sarah, Natalie, and I, and Lisa, we love to talk about this stuff. We love to, uh, um, you know, bounce ideas off of one another and hear your input and your feedback. Um, you know, that's why we're here and, and we do what we do. So if you're interested in having us do this more frequently, please just let us know that. Absolutely. We would be more than happy to come back. All right. Well, everyone, it's Thursday evening. Um, for those of you who have Fridays off, I hope you have a, a early, great early start to your weekend. If not, 
have a safe day tomorrow. Uh, be well, be safe. Um, and just remember, ADAA is here to represent you as a dental educator, to represent your students as they uh, go out and become dental assistants. We really want to make sure that we are meeting your needs. Um, and for those of you who may not be aware, uh, ADAA has issued a call to action for mandatory infection control education because we believe this is so important. So um, we would love for you to support us with that call to action. Um, and, and just, you know, we've given you our email addresses. Let us know how we can help you. Let us know how we can help your students and just know that we are here for you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Thank you, evening. Everybody. And hopefully talk to you soon. Good night. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night.